was a joy being able to hear them and also to lift our voices in praise to the Lord. And it is God's love that has won us. Amen? Amen. He pursued us when we didn't want to have anything to do with him, uh, yet his son died for us. And we are so grateful for uh, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one that saves sinners like us. And let's unite our hearts in prayer together. Our Father and our God, we are thankful to be able to be here this day to praise and honor and worship and love you because you first loved us. You loved us so much that you had your son die on the cross for us in our place to pay the penalty for our sin that we might be forgiven and have eternal life through faith in your son. Thank you for all that he accomplished at Calvary's cross. And thank you that as we gather here today, your son is our good and our great and our chief shepherd. We look to him as the, the people of your pasture, the, the sheep of your flock. We look to your son to lead us and guide us, uh, to guard us and protect us, to, to feed us and nourish us to supply all that we need. And Father, there are several here this morning that have heavy hearts. Uh, Lord, uh, Janice has had to say goodbye to her sister. Diane has had to say goodbye to her brother. Uh, Lord, others have had surgeries, uh, some sicknesses. Others have very serious doctor's appointments that are scheduled. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, some with financial needs, uh, some with uh, relationships that are, are being stretched and even perhaps ready to tear apart. Lord, as we bow here before you as a, as a congregation, we cast our every care upon you and lay all of our burdens at the feet of Jesus because we know our Savior loves us so much. And he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And the things that you allow to come into our lives, you give us the grace to not just endure, but Lord, to honor you. And as we honor you, Lord, unbelieving relatives and friends and neighbors and coworkers see us handling life, going through life, dealing with life, in a way that they can't comprehend because they don't know Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that as our lives do go through difficult times from time to time, we pray that your Son would be uplifted and magnified through it all, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be seen and alive in us, and that others might ask, of the hope, of the reason <laughs> why that we're able to go through life this way. And we can tell them it's because of our Savior and that he wants to be their Savior too. And so Lord, thank you that we're able to be here uh, praying for one another, Lord, honoring you, lifting, uniting our voices in praise to you. And we thank you that we can look into your word and look to the future and pray that you would be the one leading us into the future that you want us to have. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today we do want to start off with a question. Actually, we're going to have you thinking about several questions this morning. Uh, where are we headed? Uh, we have begun an adventure. Um, it's actually a three-year adventure around this very topic. Where are we as a congregation, as uh, Grace Independent Chapel, where are we headed toward the future? Uh, we're looking toward that, uh, what direction uh, God wants us to go, and we are um, coming up on our two-year anniversary, so we have two years into this program, this plan, this um, thought process, and we have one more to go. And so the first year, uh, we did a lot of work at the board level, trying to get the board to think and think through this type issue. The uh, second year, uh, most of it has been with our strategic planning teams, again, looking through where we headed, where we're going. And now this third year, 
it's your turn. You who are in the pews, we want you to also be on the same page, going the same direction, uh, what we believe the Lord is leading for the future in all of that. And if you haven't marked your calendars already, Saturday, October 19th, um, is there, am I too loud coming across the congregation? I sound loud up here, but maybe. If I take that off, that might help a little bit. Um, so Saturday, October 19th is going to be a, a planning session. It's our, our annual review uh, going over the progress that has been made this past year and then setting the plans in motion for the third year, the next year. And board members, um, property and finance committee, their wives, um, Sunday school teachers, uh, youth workers, um, you who are in the pew, you are invited to attend and participate that. Our um, consultant has asked us to open it up and get more people so that we can work on getting everyone on the same page and going the same direction. So where are we headed? That is our conversation. And so we do want you to be thinking about some things that we have been wrestling with here at Grace Chapel. What is our never-ending, continuously reoccurring drive and desire as a church body? Where are we headed? Where, what are we trying to accomplish? Where are we going? Uh, now, when our grandkids come to visit, they like to go to Knoebels, and uh, if they can get on a merry-go-round, they like that, and they enjoy that, um, but are you able to accomplish a whole lot on a merry-go-round? No, because you are in just going in circles in that one place, and it's fun for a little while, but eventually you get tired of doing that. And so we don't want to be a church that's just going in circles, kind of stuck doing that. Uh, we'd rather kind of be like our car. How many of you get in and out of your car every day because you have somewhere to go? You, you, there's something you want to accomplish. There's something you need to do. There's something you need to achieve. Well, we kind of want our church to be going and achieving things that are honoring to God, what he wants us as a group, as a, uh, an assembly of believers. That's actually what a church is. And we are an assembly. We're a called out people here to do heavenly business. It is so much more than four walls of a building and, and lights and heat and air conditioning. And it's, I mean, we are saints of the living God. And there is kingdom work to be done. And we need to be united in that. Now, no army, no uh, military force is going to accomplish a whole lot if everyone is kind of off doing their own thing, going their own way. They need to have that unified uh, master plan and direction for what they're going. So again, what is our never-ending, constantly reoccurring drive and desire as a church body? Hopefully your that question's kicking around inside your brain for a little bit, that you're thinking about it. We want you to think a little bit about this as well. What will we seek to accomplish until the day we die or the day we close the doors of this church for good? What are we seeking to accomplish? That is the goal, the target, the aim, the direction, the future that we need to pull together around put our energies and efforts and prayer toward. Because without that, all the energy and the effort just kind of dissipates and flows away. And we may, may end up getting to that last part of that phrase a lot sooner than what the Lord would like. We don't want doors closed. We want pews full. Any amens? Amen. All right. So after much work, much prayer, much discussion, it really has boiled down to, um, any of you ever pan for gold? Our grandchildren went out to the Dakotas and they got to do, dig some in some creek and they did some panning. They, they had they got some gemstones, but they didn't get any gold. Um, but you, you're, you're constantly shaking it out, shaking it out, shaking it out until it kind of sifts out to the, do you have that nugget that's left? Everything else has been scattered away. Well, this lengthy process that we've been working through, sifting it out, sifting out, sifting out, to this one nugget of gold is this. Connecting people to Christ and one another in love. That is our target. That's our goal. That's what we're going to do until the day we die. 
We want to connect people to Jesus. And once they're connected to Jesus, we want them to be connected with Jesus' people in love. That wonderful, never-ending love of God. There is, um, it is about relationships, our vertical relationship with God, our horizontal relationship with others, that we are connecting and connecting, and we're putting our efforts into connecting. Now, we cannot guarantee that there will be a connection made, but our heart's desire is to put the effort into helping those connections have a possibility of being made. Letting people know how much the Lord loves them, how much we love them, and how much we want to uh, see them make progress uh, spiritually in their lives and also for the glory of God. It comes from, quite easily, uh, the great commandment that the Lord has given to us, that we're to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and soul and all our mind. And this is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it, to love uh, your neighbor as yourself. Um, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Two things from God's heart to our heart. And it's all in and around and wrapped up in love. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my what? Commandments. That's how we demonstrate that we truly do love the Lord, that we're here for the Lord, that we want to uh, you know, follow the Lord and obey the Lord and do what the Lord wants us to do is by keeping his commandments. And he's told us to go and to preach the gospel to every creature, to go and to make disciples, to be on the go for him. And so he wants us to be working to connect people to himself, to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the other one, to love your neighbor as yourself, is that we connect people to one another in love. That we're following out that great commandment as we're connecting people one to another. And one aspect of this connecting is uh, found in a statement uh, like this. Helping people far from God experience the love of God through faith in the Son of God. Any amens? To be able to do that. I mean, doesn't there's something happen in your soul and your spirit that says kind of like, yes. I mean, that's it. That, that's what we're supposed to be doing is helping people that are far from God to be able to know the love of God through faith in the Son of God. Um, we, 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 want, we want to rejoice in knowing that there's one less person on their way to hell and one more person on their way to heaven. We want to see that. We want to be a part of that. We want to put our energies toward that. Uh, we want to have our prayers for that. That God is at work helping those people that are so far from him and to be able to uh, come to know him and his son, Jesus Christ, that he sent to be in the world. We could say it like this as well. Encouraging people who love to live like the devil become a person who loves to live like Jesus. Isn't that what our lives were like? We lived selfishly, we lived sinfully, we lived for what we thought was important or right or what we wanted, and it just made a mess of our lives. It was counter to what God wanted. And then there was that day that Jesus came knocking on the door of our heart, letting us know how much he loved us, all that he had done for us, and what he was offering us was a brand new life. And by his grace, we said yes. Confessed our sins, turned from that wicked life, and received eternal life. And is that not why we have been pulled together, united together here at Grace Chapel to put our efforts into seeing more people come to know Jesus as their Savior? To go from being selfish and sinful and self-promoting, which is exactly what we were, before we were saved, to being then selfless, sacrificial, servant-hearted, wanting to share, wanting to bless, wanting to give, wanting to see God get the glory. Just a complete change of heart because we've become a new person on the inside uh, where Christ has uh, redeemed us and rescued us from our destructive path. And so that gospel, that good news about Jesus and the eternal life that he offers is something that we want to look at today. And so the gospel is about God. And I'm going to ask you to help me to fill out uh, the rest of, or explain what the statements are. 
if we're going to be talking to people about God, what are some things, some truths about God that we need to share? What are we going to tell people about God? What, what, what do you try and share with people? Okay, that God is love. That is certainly a part of who our God is. What else are we going to be telling about God? He's personal, and he wants to have a relationship with us. And this personal God that wants to have a relationship with us is a loving relationship that he wants to have with us. Yes, that he sacrificed himself, and that he has, cares that much about us. And we'll actually expand on that in a little bit as we think about that, but it, God did die for our sins, yes. He's trustworthy and faithful and keeps his promises. Uh, you'll never be left holding an empty bag if you put your trust in God. Uh, he keeps his promises. You'll never, you'll never have the wool pulled over your eyes and you'll never be led down the, the wrong path. Other thoughts? Constant. Yes, you, not today that you understand then later he does a flip-flop and it's like, boy, I didn't know that about God. Uh, he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Yes, a very forgiving God. Um, why would we want to know a God that doesn't forgive us? <laughs> why, would we, why would we want to know a God that there'd be no hope of knowing him? That he does, that, but he's made that way. Other thoughts? Okay, there's no shadow of turning. He, he is light and the righteousness, uh, and uh, that's something that we're not but we're going to get to that in just a little bit. God. He's creator. Yes. Pardon me? Yes, through our, the purpose that he has for us. He didn't just kind of wind us up and let us go. There's a the plan and purpose over all arching. Um, sovereign is a, a very good word. Okay, he most definitely loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. He answers prayer. He's a very active God. Yes. Okay, he offers up his eternal life. Um, is he in the wood? Can we carve a tree? and have a God that's made out of a tree? He's not the wood, the hay, the, he's stones, he's not, he's not an idol. He's everywhere present. But he is not in those things. He's created those things. Because there are worldviews out there. Any other thing about God? He is alive, yes. And so from God, who is great and perfect and unchanging and loving and relational and active and all those things, comes ourselves in comparison. Is it a good comparison? Or do we begin to see that there's a great big gulf and of difference between us? About ourselves being what? Before we know Christ, how would you describe ourselves? Sinful? Lost? Other thoughts? Selfish? Okay. Without hope? And you're thinking along the right line? Spiritually blind, dead, corrupt, polluted. Other thoughts? Not a very pretty picture, is it? You'd probably be in need of a savior. 
kind of puts, puts the bottom line we're in need of a savior because there is a God and we are not like him we don't measure up we never could measure up we've all fallen short uh, and because of that there's a problem God loves us but we're not able to enter into uh, the full expression of that love because we're sinful and our sin is what separates us from our God and so God loves us so much he didn't want us to leave us that way he sent his son to be the savior and what would you like to say about Jesus Ah, the way. Without him, there's no going. Without him, there's no knowing. Uh, without him, there's no living. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he is the one that puts it all together for us. Other thoughts? Sacrificial. Sacrificial. He did not have to do what he did. He wanted to. Uh, and to follow the Father's instructions as well as to provide salvation for people like you and me. What else about our Savior? Most definitely sinless. Uh, there was never a day that he made a mistake. As a carpenter, uh, he didn't cut the board too short and then decide to stretch it because he made a mistake. He's a, brother. a brother, yes, and a friend, and who sticks very close to us. the one and only. It is very exclusive. There is, um, there's many ways to the cross, but there's only one way to heaven, uh, and Jesus is that one way. And he's also here today, walking up and down the pews, and also looking at all of our hearts, knowing everything that we think, evaluating our love level for him, our obedience level to him, uh, he knows how genuine we are or how fake we are. Um, he is God. And so everything we said about God, we can be saying about the Savior as well. All right, the gospel is powerful. Power of God unto salvation to all that believe, Paul tells us in Romans. And in what ways is the gospel powerful? Cleansing power, yes. Uh, what was completely polluted and dirty and defiled, made clean. Washed pure white in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, miraculous. Does what we can't do. There's no way that we could change, uh, just as the scripture says, can the leper change its spots? No, but God can. He can do uh, anything he wants in his creation. And so God is the one that is able to do the miraculous and save people that are actually his enemies and have, want to have nothing to do with them. Powerful. What else can you say about powerful? Transforming. Transforming. Continuing to make us more like Jesus. Uh, and uh, we are growing in Christ-likeness and maturing. more powerful than, pardon me? Okay, the power of the Holy Spirit within us to, to live the life, uh, his life uh, through us and for, for himself and for his glory. And so is it more powerful than death? Is it more powerful than sin? More powerful than Satan? More powerful than our own selfish desires? More powerful than all of that is the gospel that is at work in us, the resurrection power of Christ. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the, the blood of his son cleanses us and continues to cle keep us clean. The wonderful gospel of Christ. It's not that it's 20, 30, 40 years ago, God did something miraculous in my life. He's doing something even now. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that gospel must be embraced because we can know it in our head but where does it need to actually reside in our heart we need to accept that embrace that 
transfer our trust from off of ourselves to our Savior and say, yes, he is the one that I need to be in the lead of my life and the Lord of my life as well as the Savior of my soul. Is it okay that your parents believed and embraced? It's a good thing, but is it good enough for you? No. <laughs> and because of what? It needs to be embraced. How? Individually, personally. There needs to be that day, that time, that place when Christ became real to you, uh, your personal Lord and Savior, uh, that it is embraced. And then the gospel is life altering, it changes us changes our priorities, changes our attitude, uh, changes our outlook, changes how we talk, changes where we go. Uh, it changes and changes and keeps on changing us, as was told, that it is transforming. Uh, the, the life that Christ gives to us transforms us from what we were to what God wants us to be, like his son. And he keeps on working with us day in and day out, even though we're not perfect and we do make mistakes and uh, we fall short, uh, it's, he picks us back up again and gets us going. And so the gospel is what gives us that opportunity concerning what we're all about. That's why we're here in these pews, worshiping our God. It's because of the gospel, the good news of Jesus who died and was buried, rose again, and is soon coming back before his people, that as we put our faith and trust in him, God forgives our sins, cleanses our soul, gives us new life, and will do that for anyone of any age that honors his son like that, that puts their trust and faith in him. And so seeing God work, that's what we're talking about, is seeing God work, not just the 20, 30, 40 years ago. We're very glad for that. We're thankful for that. We praise the Lord for that but also today, seeing God work in our lives today and knowing that he will be working in our lives tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And we are seeing God work in our lives, the lives of our family members and neighbors and coworkers uh, to see God work in our own church, our own uh, community, our country and around the world, seeing God at work praying toward that end, uh, uniting toward that end, uh, sacrificing toward that end, seeing God work, and having then those lives that are tr being transformed, that life that is transformed, producing more of the fruit of the Spirit, um, being able to uh, give and receive forgiveness more and more, having healthy relationships of, of trust and love and respect uh, for each other, and building, uh, being more like Jesus and less like our old selves, where we have those fresh encounters with God because they're fueled by our humble obedience to our Lord and our wholehearted trust in his character, who he is and what he said in his word. And we're daily walking with Christ, our Lord, each and every day living for him and with him and seeing him do great and mighty things. But all across the country, it is a challenge. It is a challenge to get that gospel out and see new people put their faith and trust in him and to have uh, the, the kingdom and family of God growing and expanding. So I do have a, a, a video clip I want to show you. This gentleman is inviting the current generation to come to a conference uh, to be able to hear how to reach the next generation. What I want to use is this video clip as an invitation to invite you to our session on Saturday, October 19th how God wants to use us here at Grace Chapel to reach the lost that are all around us. People that aren't in church yet, uh, people that don't know the Savior yet, and people that don't know the songs to be able to praise Him. Uh, whether you're listening to the radio or singing out of a hymnal, they, they don't know the songs, uh, but they are able to come to know Christ as we look and reach out and have those plans and purposes together. And so uh, you watch this video as we think about being invited here for Saturday, October 19th. I want to share a story with you that I thought about this last week. It happened when I was a young leader in a church in Florida, and we happened to have a church that was located near the Kennedy Space Center. We had a lot of members in our church that actually worked there, and, um, and everything had come to this decision that as a church we were trying to make related to our programming or schedule change, that 
was kind of controversial. And I remember the night of the business meeting, um, several of the older members showed up because they were frustrated with the change. And uh, we were wrestling with how do we navigate this. And that evening in the business meeting, there was a lot of uh, emotions and things kind of escalated to this really tense moment. When one of the senior adults in the church stood up and uh, he happened to be uh, one of the launch directors for the, for the shuttle uh, program. And when he stood up, everybody got quiet because he carried a lot of weight. And he looked around the room and he said something that I've never forgotten to the senior adults that were in the room that day. He said, we can't sacrifice this present generation on the altar of our preferences. In other words, he was saying to his peers, to the people that had built that church, that it was time for change. And, and, and we needed to be careful that we didn't, because of what we loved and what we liked and, and what we preferred, that we needed to make sure we didn't leave the next generation behind, that, that we needed to be intentional about making the changes that need to happen so that the generation coming behind us has a version of faith and a version of the church that works for them. The reason that's such a powerful story for me is because I think as we lead, we have to be very intentional about always making the adjustments we need to make for the sake of the generation who's coming behind us. This year at Orange Conference 2020, we're actually going to have a theme that, that I love. It's, it's a theme that we've talked a lot about, but it simply says every generation needs a new revolution. It's, it's asking those of us who are leaders to lean in and to ask some hard questions about what we do. It's simply suggesting something that I think we need to realize, and that's that you know, what we did that worked in the past isn't what will work in the present. And that means, that implies that what we're doing in the present isn't going to work in the future. Um, for me, that's important because as I look back across the last 10 years and as I set up for the next decade, you know, I'm always rethinking things. And um, as a matter of fact, 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Think Orange. And about a year ago, I pulled it out and I started looking at it to see what had changed and what didn't change. I've started actually working through the process of updating that book because I think it's important for me to rethink not what is timeless, but to rethink what needs to change in programming. And what we have been doing may not necessarily be what we need to do. Um, and, and, I, and the reason I think this is important is because there are some of us who sometimes feel threatened by change. We actually, because we're holding on to what we consider to be eternal and timeless principles, think that if we change, it could threaten the mission. But any of us who've led for very long at all know something else is also true. That it's not change that threatens the mission, but it's not changing that threatens the mission. So what I want to invite you into is this idea of thinking in terms of a new generation who needs a new revolution. That we have to listen to the voices of those coming behind us and we have to get around the table in an intergenerational way to go, what are the things that we're going to do as we're looking forward in the future? 2020 is a big year. It kind of sets into motion this idea of a brand new decade. And what I'm going to suggest is this, that we need a new revolution in how we're going to communicate to kids and students. We know more than we've ever known before in, in, in science and research about how the mind of a child and the mind of a teenager works. And we have to do even a better job this next decade in taking what is timeless theological ideas and truths and pairing them with the way a kid learns at every phase. And we need a new revolution on how we rally volunteers. I, I'm, I'm going to suggest something, and maybe you've already figured this out, that the way you recruit and develop volunteers will ultimately determine whether kids walk away from your church or stay in your church. If you do this right, if you develop the right kind of leaders in your church, kids will show up every week simply to connect with the people that they want to do life with. And the reason this is so important is because there's still a generation walking away from the church when you look at statistics. And what we're discovering is they're not walking away from relationships. They're walking away from programs that may not connect with them or connect them relationally. So we need a new, a new, a new revolution as it relates to how we rally volunteers. And we need a new revolution in how we engage parents. Um, I think there are two things that will always be true in the church. One is Sunday morning is a very, very critical, pivotal moment in time in what we create from a programming standpoint. But we're discovering that more and more parents aren't coming on Sunday mornings. And so we have to shift in the way we think 
How are we going to only measure success by the parents and the families who attend on Sunday? How can we start asking questions about what are we going to do to engage a generation of parents who aren't there on Sunday? What does it look like to build that bridge in a different way as, as family is being redefined all around us? And we need a new revolution in how we transform communities. Um, I, I don't know if you realize this, but the decisions you make as a church in what you do will either shrink your influence with your community or it will increase your influence with your community. And I think we're going to be called in the next decade as the neighborhood is changing around all of our churches to be more involved, to get a little messier when it comes to reaching out and actually showing up on the front lines of what's happening in our community to build a different kind of bridge. And, and what I'm discovering is that there's a generation who's not anti-church. They just don't have church on their radar because they're not sure that the church actually um, exists to help them solve the problems and the issues they're dealing with every day. They need a new version of the church that gives them a different kind of hope and a different kind of faith. And then I think we need a new revolution in how we actually measure success. Um, Again, the reason I think this is important is because there are old yardsticks that in the past we have layered up against the church when it comes to, you know, budget, when it comes to, to um, attendance, when it comes to a lot of things that we've measured when it comes to numerical growth. But what would it look like if we created some new yardsticks in this next decade to reevaluate how we measure success, because how you measure success will also determine how you manage your resources and how you manage your talent and how you manage your ministry. So it's important for us to invite a group of leaders into a different kind of culture where they can win in a, in a very clear way when it comes to um, building a ministry for the next generation. And then last of all, I would say this and see if this makes sense. As we think about Orange Conference 2020, I think we need a new revolution simply in how we lead the church. Um, I, I don't know if you realize this, but it's really kind of simple. Change is never an option. How we handle change is the issue. How we lead through change is the critical thing we need to think about. And um, if you're a leader and you're watching this, which I'm making that assumption, then whether you like it or not, you know, you are having to lead through changes that are happening in your culture, and you're having to figure out in your ministry how you're going to adjust the sales so you can, again, highlight a timeless mission and timeless values. The, the point is, I, I love the context of what an Orange Conference does or an Orange event does because we bring in a lot of people who are dissatisfied with the status quo. And what we love to do is to put leaders in front of you, not, not only church leaders, but leaders in front of you who actually have led through changes in their organizations to teach us principles of how to lead through those kinds of waters and, and to navigate you know, into, into the next decade in the future. I, I think that's important because some of us you know, need to stretch you know, our imagination of what we can do. And you're invited to be a part of what I think is gonna be an amazing conference in Orange, uh, conference 2020 uh, as we all rally together to go what is it we need to do we're going to ask you to basically do two things one is to partner with us to rethink we'd love for you to start rethinking now w what will the next decade look like and let's create a network and conversations around that and then to get really practical and to partner with us to actually redesign redesign our ministries in a way that can recapture the imagination of a generation who has walked away from the church but needs to know in a fresh way what faith, what hope, what love looks like in the context of the New Testament. Change is inevitable. How we lead through change is going to be the test in this next year. So we want to invite you to make some radical changes as we try in the next decade to approach ministry in a brand new way. Come join us for Orange Conference 20, and um, we'll have a great conversation and start doing some new, fresh things in this next decade. All right, he said a lot <clears throat> and trying to get leaders across the country to come together. Uh, we just want you to come to the tables on Saturday the 19th and be able to see how God is continuing to advance his mission, his work through us uh, here at Grace Chapel. And so let's have a word of prayer. We'll ask our ushers if they could gather at the back uh, and then we'll be able to receive our Connect and Communicate cards as well. Father, we are thankful 
for you and your great love for us. And we acknowledge that we live in a changing world and we are asking for your help to lead us, guide us successfully through uh, the, the changes that are, are coming our way, Lord. Uh, we so desire to see those that are not yet here, that are not yet Christians, come to know Christ, to be delivered from bondage to sin and uh, the selfishness and even to perhaps to Satan himself. Lord, we know that there are many challenges and it is uh, messy, it's not easy. But Father, we want to be the men and women of God that your son Jesus died on the cross for us to be. That it would not be about us, it would be about you. Your plan, your program, your truth, your, your son and your gospel. That he would be the one exalted and magnified through it all. And so thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing here at Grace Chapel. And we pray you'd continue to lead and guide us into the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Connect and Communicate card with you, please take that out. Uh, put it, uh, your name on the front and any questions, any prayer concerns, uh, we'll list them on the back and simply put them in the offering plate uh, as we're about to receive. And so Donnie, would you ask a blessing on the offering, please?